from the studios of Postscript Media and Canary Media. For decades, we have wildly underestimated the growth of renewables. This is a well-known problem in energy circles. There's this wide gap in growth projections from analysts who are focused on trends in renewables and the energy modelers at institutions like the International Energy Agency or the U.S. Energy Information Administration. And I saw this really early in my career when the Sierra Club issued a 2007 report showing explosive growth for solar through 2020. And the technology barely registered on other forecasts. And there were plenty of people who were skeptical of an environmental group putting out solar projections. But in fact, the Sierra Club numbers turned out to be really conservative. And this has played out in lots of different ways. Ramez Nam noticed this phenomenon a few years later in 2011 as he started mapping the cost curve of renewables. And at the time, the IEA, National Energy Agency, uh, had a forecast for solar costs that the cost of solar electricity would drop uh, by about a half from 2010 to 2050. Now, to put that in perspective, the cost per watt of solar panels and the cost of generated solar electricity fell by 90% in a decade. Dick Swanson, the founder of SunPower, predicted this trend in 2006 as he looked at historic trends in the semiconductor industry. And Ramez and others saw the same thing. I came from tech where we have Moore's Law, and so I just applied the very same sort of very dumb learning model to solar. And because I didn't know enough about energy to like know how I was going to be wrong, I just, it worked, more or less. <laughs> so my forecast was the cost of solar would drop by about a factor of 10 to 2050, and it actually dropped twice as fast as I thought it would. Ramez is a technologist who studies trends in decarbonization. This is him on stage in Seattle at a recent Canary Media Live event talking with journalist David Roberts. And the cost curve, he says, is still headed downward. Will it keep getting cheap? Like, the future is uncertain, but the odds are yes. So my personal forecast is the cost of solar electricity will drop by another factor of four uh, by the time electricity is, by the time solar is about a third of all uh, electricity generation on Earth. Now, many of the traditional modeling agencies have changed the way they analyze renewables, but the trends are still taking a lot of people by surprise, particularly those who are operating infrastructure. Back in February, we made an episode about how 99% of coal plants in America are more expensive to operate than new renewables. And Ramez looks at this and says it clearly marks a new phase for the build-out of wind, solar, and batteries. Clean electricity, especially solar, and now batteries have gone through They're entering their third phase. The first phase was all of history from the 1970s to 2010, 2015. They were in their first phase that was uh, totally uncompetitive, totally policy dependent. Then with a a second phase where new electricity from solar and wind became cheaper in some parts of the world than building new power from gas and coal, at least during the hours the sun shone or that the wind did. And that's their second phase, cost competitive. And now they're into their third phase, the cost just on a pure kilowatt hour basis of electricity from new solar, new wind would be cheaper than the operational cost of an already built coal or gas power plant. And that is, that's happening. This era has only begun, and it's challenging the economics of conventional generation in markets around the world. I do think there's lots of reasons, not in every single clean tech, but in those, and the ones we make in factories, mass produce in high volumes, that those will have a very, very rapid learning rate uh, for decades to come. This is The Carbon Copy. I'm Stephen Lacey. This week, a conversation between journalist David Roberts and futurist Ramez Nam about what's ahead in the energy transition. This podcast is brought to you by CorePower, an American manufacturer of battery cells for electric vehicles and stationary storage. CorePower founder and CEO Lindsey Goral is a former executive in the mining industry, and he's now devoting his career to building U.S. industrial capacity in clean energy. Yeah, I can tell you it's a lot of stress (laughs) to build a company, but I think personally, it's just the ability to build something that I believe we need. Stay with us to the end of the show. We'll have an interview with Lindsay about Core Power's gigawatt-scale battery facility underway in Arizona. America's green banks are preparing to unleash a wave of capital for clean energy. The Greenhouse Gas Reduction Fund invests a historic $27 billion in projects nationwide. This could mobilize up to $150 billion of private capital for solar, storage, efficiency, and electrification in underserved communities. So how do we deploy those billions quickly, efficiently, and with the highest impact? 
On July 18th, Latitude Media and Banyan Infrastructure will host a virtual event exploring the -the on-the-ground realities of making America's green banks a success. Register for free by clicking the link in the show notes or go to latitudemedia.com slash events. Clean energy and climate tech are policy-driven industries, and anyone working in this field touches local, state, and federal policy in a very real way. And that's why you should be listening to Political Climate, a podcast from Latitude Media and Boundary Stone Partners that delivers an insider's view on climate policy and politics. Every other week, co-hosts Julia Piper, Emily Dominich, and Brandon Hurlbuck cover the nuances of government funding, regulations, backroom negotiations, and the election, of course. Political Climate is a show for people who want authentic conversations and strong opinions from voices across the political spectrum. Listen at latitudemedia.com or subscribe to the show anywhere you get your podcasts. In late June, our partners at Canary Media hosted a live event at KEXP in Seattle. And the estimable journalist David Roberts was there recording a live conversation with Ramez Nam for his podcast, Volts. Both of these guys are very well versed in a wide array of decarbonization topics. David has been covering this space for a couple of decades. He runs the newsletter Volts and the podcast Volts, and he's an editor at large at Canary Media. And Ramez has been focused on this space for over a decade. He came to climate tech with a background in technology, and science fiction. And in this interview, both of these guys cover a lot of ground, from the competitiveness of wind, solar, and EVs, to grid modernization, to space-based solar, to geoengineering. And we're going to play an edited version of that conversation for you now. So here it is. They started with the role of renewables in an electrified economy. One of the big questions about um, the electrify everything model uh, is wind and solar variable even with batteries, the batteries we have today, you can get two, four, maybe six, eight hours out of lithium-ion batteries, but you still have variability to deal with. And so there's this idea that sort of you're going to get to, depending on who you ask, 60, 70, 80, 90 percent, and you're going to have to fill in the remainder with something else. And it seems to me whether that's 60 percent or 90 percent depends a lot on just how cheap solar and wind get. So I guess I'm, I guess what I'd like to ask is how far do you think Electrify Everything is going to go? Do you think these learning curves are going to be so far and so fast that we're going to end up needing less of that supplemental stuff than is currently forecast? Yeah, it, it varies on a variety of things. It varies on geography. So for instance, Europe is harder to power with renewables than the U.S. is, because the U.S. has more sunshine, and solar is cheap the fastest. Europe has, like, the high... Europe or Japan or Taiwan or South Korea are these places that have winter peaking systems and don't have a lot of sun. So they're more dependent on wind. doesn't get cheap as fast. Uh, it also matters how big the grid is. Like, if we built a Chinese-scale grid in the U.S., you could have solar going from New Mexico to New York. You could have wind from the Great Plains going out to the coast. But if we don't get transmission built, and right now we're sucking at building transmission in the U.S., then like powering New York in winter is actually really hard. Uh, so those are like big variables. And in general, I have my opinions on what I think is going to get cheap the fastest, but I'm in general a believer in like, let's have more tools in the toolkit than we think we need, because some of them are not going to pan out in certain areas. So let's invest in all of it. Let's invest in small modular reactor, nuclear, nuclear fusion, uh, transmission grids, ultra long duration energy storage, power to hydrogen. Let's do all of it and like be in a situation where we have more tools than we need rather than fewer. All right, you're doing the all all the above cop out, so I'm going to put you on this. <laughs> <laughs> so you have so, solar, wind, and battery. You have your, your you have your variable core, and yep. then you have your the supplements to even out the power, smooth out the power. Yeah. Right now, what's going to occupy that role? Yeah. That supplemental role is up in the air. Could be yeah. Um, could be a lot more storage. It could be, as you say, a lot more transmission. Yeah. It could be some sort of clean, firm yeah. power like uh, geothermal or uh, small nukes. It could be small natural gas plants with CCS, which yeah. is what you see in the models, in the Net big models. They yeah. have truckloads of, of natural gas with CCS, all playing the same basic role, which is evening out the variability of renewable energy. So I, I want to know, yes, we want to invest in everything. Yes, we want to pursue everything. Yep. Yes, we want to keep our options open. But in your opinion, 
So what probably, is the mix that's going to play that role? The most underrated of those technologies is super long duration transmission. That is probably the one that we long don't distance, have. Long distance, you mean? Ultra long distance, like coast to coast, continent scale transmission. It's probably the one that has the best upside and the most certainty that we can do it. But it's blocked not by economics, not by technology, but by permitting fundamentally. And we're not doing a lot of, on there. I think um, clean firm, whether you call it nuclear vision, SMR vision, fusion, geothermal everywhere, you know, ultra deep geothermal can get power any place on the earth, uh, has a big role to play. Ultra long duration storage is a wild card. Like 12 hour storage, I'm convinced, is like that's going to be solved. But in Europe, uh, or on the U.S. East Coast, you need weeks or months of storage. Right. And we don't, there's a few technologies that might do that, but they're wild cards right now. Um, I think offshore wind has a huge role to play, and floating offshore wind is one of the most underrated technologies because in deep water, you basically can't do bottom out uh, offshore wind. So around Japan or the U.S. West Coast, I think floating offshore wind is probably also a massively underrated technology. And then my, my very favorite total wild card in these that nobody believes in really but me is uh is space-based solar i knew it <laughs> and that one that made I, my friend greg maniac has been talking about space-based solar for a decade and i'd be like no 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 greg 20 percent of the earth's land area is desert like space launch costs so much why would we ever do this but in space there's no clouds uh you can just have it you can get 24 7 power you can beam it to earth with microwaves that penetrate clouds and rain uh and some models show it getting in at like two or three cents a kilowatt hour, based on things like how, how cheap Starship is going to make launch cost, we think. Right, and isn't space, it's getting cheaper, right? And getting up to space is space launch, rapidly getting cheaper. Space launch is getting cheaper faster than solar. Um, mm. only, only two things in history have gotten cheap faster than solar to date, which are computing uh, and gene sequencing or gene printing. But right now, we're going to face where the cost of space launch is actually dropping faster than the cost of solar. And so that, and then you have this other advantage, you beam power back to Earth and microwaves. There's a variety of challenges of it, let me tell you. <laughs> uh, there's a lot of challenges. Uh, but if you, if you beam it down at the same intensity as sunlight, your antennas are like three or four times as efficient. So you get four times the power per the same land area, and it works in winter. So that's, that's my personal wild card. There's only like, there's like six startups in the whole world doing it. But I'm, I'm has, actually has looking... There been, has there been solar power transmitted? To Earth from space, like as it, no. uh, as it, as it actually no. happened. <laughs> no, and there's there's various problems with it. So we we've had the first experiments of transmitting. We have lots of solar in space for satellites, and we have the first experiments happening for transmitting solar from one satellite to another. Uh, but the big problem. So there's some startups that are using lasers. Lasers are BS because lasers don't penetrate clouds and rain. So why would you do it? It doesn't matter. But one of them just raised a bunch of money. Whatever. Uh, the way to actually do it is microwaves. But the the problem with microwaves is if you want to hit a target on Earth. <laughs> You need these kilometer square arrays in space, and no one's ever built anything of that size in space. So it's, if you want sci-fi, and I want some sci-fi. And do you that's fry totally the birds? Sci-fi. Do you fry the birds? You can transmit it. I mean, you could if you're really if you're really good. If you wanted to. No one can get that good. No one can get that good at beaming <laughs> microwaves yet. Um, but you could transmit it at like one sunlight intensity, but get three or four times the energy on the ground in the same area. So you, it, like, getting to where you can fry birds is actually a really, really hard problem. <laughs> it's not the problem that we have right now. Interesting, interesting. And this brings up my, my lonely wild card, since yeah. you were talking about lonely wild cards, the one that only I seem to care about, which is wireless charging of electrical devices, which I always, which I always thought conceptually solves all kinds of problems. Like, you just imagine, you know, power transmitters seeded throughout your city and every electrical device having a, a receiver able to receive power through the air. I mean, these, those technologies ex- exist. Like yeah. you can power something at a distance. Now, even at a reasonably large distance, there are like sonar versions, laser versions, there's x-ray, weird x-ray versions. And I just thought like, cut the cord, all, this, all these charging difficulties go away. Basically, everything electrical is charging all the time. When I, when I do my little, you know, the future meme, you know, the future world, we're going to have meme, like, it's all wireless charging. Do you have an eye on that? Is anything happening there? Do you, do you think that's going to go anywhere? I have a little bit of an eye on that, but it, doesn't, it still doesn't solve all the problems because it's really hard to do super long distance. Again, unless you build these, if you want to penetrate clouds anyway, unless you build these kilometer square transmitters, uh, so I think for a short range, like within our room, 
um, there, there are potential, or maybe for like mountaintop to mountaintop, but getting it you know, across a continent without bouncing it in space is really hard, I think. All right, and you are in tech, really, and not really in politics, but I'm curious what your take is on, you know, the... I wouldn't say that IRA has taken care of the funding problem. I mean, I think we still need a lot more funding for everything all the time, everywhere. But but there's a huge accelerant now, at least in terms yeah. of money. So what do you see then when you think about the U.S. Um, decarbonizing? Yeah. What are the big remaining barriers that worry it's a really good question. I'd say, like, the IRA is just part of the puzzle. Like, the IRA, it's interesting. The IRA is understated. It's not $450 billion of federal spending a year. It's, like, trillions. Because the IRA is not a pool of money. It's a per-unit subsidy. And forecasters always do what? On unit forecasts, they always underestimate it, right? So the actual size of the IRA is actually much larger. And at the same I think time, Goldman, just, Goldman Sachs said $1.3 trillion, I think, was its number, as opposed to the official number, which was $3.9 Three hundred and some billion, or forty. Yeah, billion. three hundred something billion, um, but a lot more than the official forecast. Yeah, and I'd say the IRA also. Like we we talk a lot about the U.S., but let's think about this globally. Like three big things happening in global climate policy over the last few years. China has further put uh, its foot on the accelerator. India has done some, but I won't count that. Vladimir Putin invading Ukraine. Putin is like now a climate hero. I mean, he's an asshole, <laughs> but he's but he's he's done all this work because we thought natural gas was going to be the last fossil fuel we got off of, and Putin thought, you know, the natural gas exports to Europe, he had Europe over a barrel. But instead, he's accelerated the pace which Europe is getting off of gas, deploying more renewables, ultra-long duration storage, hydrogen, funding fusion, all this stuff. So those are equally big, and the IRA is really big. What is the IRA uh, not, and by, oh, by the way, in the U.S., we talk about the IRA, we don't talk enough about state-level policies. 29 states in the U.S., have a binding RPS or CES, right? And that's, that's sort of before the IRA, and it's actually potentially even, even more impactful. Uh, what does the IRA not solve? It doesn't solve permitting. And that's actually like the Achilles heel that we have. And we talk about permitting, like if there's a strain of environmentalism that is like, don't build it environmentalism, and that's going to kill us. Like that's the, the biggest political barrier we have in the U.S. is that it's so dang hard to build things. And people talk about NEPA reform, whatever. NEPA is just the feds. Like, if you want to build something, it's this internested uh, issue of multiple federal agencies and then multiple states and then county level and city level and every property owner. We just had the first interstate transmission line in the U.S., the biggest one, approved like two months ago, I think, Arizona to California. Yeah, I think it's an $8 billion project. Okay, that's, I mean, we spent trillions, right? Uh, that $8 billion project took 18 years to get approval from multiple states, uh, multiple counties, landowners, and so on. If that's the pace, we're just in a world of hurt. So what do I think? The most important thing we can do in policy in the U.S. is get out of the way and allow stuff to be built. NIMBY is like the, the death of the world if we don't stop it. Yeah. <laughs> this is going to be a, this is going to be an interesting uh, internecine tension. I think that's there's a great there's a great article in Heat Map about it just uh, this week. Everybody should be reading Heat Map. It was about this, and I wrote <clears throat> not to. Eric has an opinion on that. <laughs> <laughs> After you're done with Canary, you should read uh, you should read Heat Map. Uh, and I, not to toot my own horn, but I wrote about this back in 2012 or whatever, but this distinction between climate hawks and environmentalists is how I put it. People who are primarily focused on decarbonization, people who are primarily coming out of the environmental movement with all its sort of associated commitments and, and, and whatnot. And I think this is going to be a huge tension, but it's also, do you worry at all? Maybe you don't worry. I worry about... A lot of the people who are yelling about permitting are, want to cut down environmental review because they don't care about the environment and want more oil and gas and don't, you, you know, this is, this is all bad faith from one large portion of this debate. Do you worry about being on the same side with a bunch of bad faith 
jerk offs. I think the bad faith, the bad faith actors, the actors that want like permanent reforms so they can build more fossil fuels, are on the losing side of history. They're just they're betting on a technology that fundamentally is going to lose on cost. So I say let it come. Like in an open playing field, if it's easier to build pipelines and transmission lines, clean electricity is going to win. So I'm totally happy taking that deal. You know, Bernie Sanders disagrees, right? Like he he voted against the Schumer Mansion permanent reform bill that you had one Republican vote for uh, because he's so obsessed, as Senator Darmel is obsessed with don't build fossil fuels. Well, guess what? Building more renewables is actually more important than not building fossil fuel on, on a competitive basis, at least my bet, the clean energy just wins on cost. So, like, open the floodgates, let it in, and clean energy is going to win, is my well, personal well, viewpoint on this. What do you make of, of this, um, you know, this just came out, another version of, of, of information that's come out over and over again over the years, which just shows that fossil fuels are not declining. Globally, they're not declining. We are adding on to the total energy load of the world. That's what renewables are doing, is increasing the total, but the actual amount of fossil fuels is not declining, which leads yeah. a lot of people to say building new renewables is not enough. We have to cut off supply at some point. What do you make of that argument? So I think you've got you to look at leading indicators and trailing indicators. And the leading indicator is cost. What's going to win economically? And then the second, you know, the next indicator, this is the like, next derivative is like pace of deployment increase. And then actual deployment and like actual like deployed stocks is a super trailing indicator. So you look at, you look at this and are we growing uh, renewables fast enough now? Are they undoing uh, fossil fuels? Well, actually, we might have passed peak fossil fuels in the power sector in 2022. Uh, all the growth, we have not yet shrunk the internal combustion engine car fleet, but what was the, anybody want to guess, like, what's the year in which we sell more, uh, sorry, in which sales of gasoline powered cars peaks? Anybody have a guess? 2017, 2018. It happened already. Now, we wanted to go down faster. We want, uh, the retirements of ICEs, cars, to be faster than deployments. But all the growth in vehicles, and passenger vehicles, is electric. So have we peaked yet? No. And I think we'll have peak total fossil fuels and peak emissions sometime later in this decade, uh, towards 2030. It's not fast enough. Uh, but we, like, the writing is on the wall. Like, fossil fuels are, are primarily dead men walking. It's just a matter of how fast can we pull it off. On July 18th, join Latitude Media and Banyan Infrastructure as we take a deep dive into the next phase of deploying the $27 billion Greenhouse Gas Reduction Fund. We'll provide practical insights for the state agencies and local lenders at the front lines of dispensing these funds. Where are the bottlenecks? How do we balance speed with transparency? And can America's green banks live up to the expectations of both local communities and Wall Street? Latitude Media Stephen Lacey, Banyan co-founder Amanda Lee, and Clean Energy Fund of Texas EVP Billy Briscoe will answer these questions and more on July 18th at 1 p.m. Eastern. This is a must-attend for project developers and financiers. Register for free at latitudemedia.com slash events or click the link in the show notes. I'm Julia Piper. I'm Brandon Hurlbut. And I'm Emily Dominich. A little over a year ago, political climate took a break so we could focus on the groundwork of implementing America's biggest ever climate bill, the Inflation Reduction Act. I'm excited to say political climate is back. And I'll be joined by my two co-hosts to riff on the top political stories and insider scoops from state houses to the halls of Congress to regulatory agencies and even international climate talks. We'll explain how those developments are driving industry decisions today. Political Climate is a show for people who want authentic conversations. And to learn about how energy and climate policy is shaped within both political parties from the people who have actually helped shape it. So join me, Brandon and Emily, every other week, starting in April, for fresh episodes of Political Climate. Subscribe to the show wherever you listen to podcasts. So let's talk then about about uh, the hard to abate sectors then, because they're the ones. You know, I think we can. I wouldn't say we have electricity in hand, but we have a we have a, a sight line to where we're going yeah. on electricity. We have a sight line where we're going on transportation. We have I'm a sight line in buildings. Although this crowd is full of people who will. Tell us all about the many complications of, of doing what we know how to do in buildings, but we know how to do what we need to do in buildings. But there are these legendary, difficult to decarbonize sectors. So two questions. One is, do you think they're still, do you think they still warrant that term? Do you think they're still difficult to decarbonize? 
And, uh, and which of those worry you? Yeah, they are. And so I should say that what I've been saying is mostly related to power and ground transport. That's where we have really, really fast learning rates. Um, but if you add up ground transport and power, you've got maybe 45% of global carbon emissions, right? The other, the really big ones are industrial emissions, or who will talk about cement. Uh, mine math is more like six, 7% of emissions. Steel is another seven or eight. But like industrial emissions are really hard. Uh, and it's not clear that the learning rates will be as fast as our renewables. So that is a big problem. That said, like I wrote a piece for TechCrunch in 2018 or something where I was really worried about this. And we've made more progress faster on industrial emissions than I expected those four or five years ago. So are we going to go fast enough? I don't know. But we're, we're moving that, that, that needle. And then the other one that, that's hard and big, let's talk about aviation. Steel is four times as big as aviation, right? Like aviation we will solve eventually, but steel and cement are really big ones. But the other one that's really hard is agriculture, forestry, and land use. Cows and deforestation. Mm -hmm. And that one's not growing, really, but it's about a quarter of all emissions. It's bigger than industrial emissions. It rivals electricity. Um, and that's going to take a mix of just pure policy work to protect land uh, and finding a way to feed the world's appetite for meat, which is just going to go up. Like, forget about reducing meat consumption. It ain't going to happen. Meat consumption is going to keep going like this and this. So we've got to find ways to produce that meat, or something that people think is meat, at a way that, that's cost, comp and I, I'm actually not that bullish on alternative proteins either. I think it's got to be like, mostly it's going to be fields, like where we grow corn and, and soy and so on today, and wheat and, and ha animal agriculture is my guess. We've got to find a way with a, a cost perspective to reduce that cost, reduce the emissions, reduce emissions of things like fertilizer, that might be six or seven percent of emissions, and protect land from being converted from forest or wetlands uh, into uh, into crops uh, or grazing land, and that one that one cows and steel and cement keep me up more than electricity and uh, cars. So what what is happening in steel? Like you say, we're making more progress than you thought. What is the what is the the solution that you? Yeah, I mean, I think with steel, the most likely solution um, is power to hydrogen. Uh, like a lot of the steel emissions. So for recycled steel. Increasing we use electric arc furnaces, you can power them with renewables. Uh, but for primary steel, we use coal as a reducing agent. Iron ore has oxygen on it. You've got to strip the oxygen off. So we're using the coal. You can bust the coal. You get carbon monoxide. It binds with oxygen and strips it off. It's a reducing agent. So you can use hydrogen for that. And hydrogen does look like it's going to have a, a sharp reduction. It's not the only bet. There's other bets, I think. Uh, Breakthrough invested in a company that does a form of uh, electrolysis to extract uh, pig iron or uh, sorry iron, pure iron ore from uh, or pure iron that you can use to make steel from iron ore. So there are multiple technology pathways in each of these, uh, but right now hydrogen looks like the best bet I'd say for steel. Well, let's talk about hydrogen for a second then, because this is like uh, as Amy said earlier, everybody hydrogen is on everybody's tip of everybody's tongue, it's the, it's the next uh, uh, bell of the ball. Everyone loves it, everyone thinks it's gonna do everything. And you can technically do everything with it <laughs> if, you, yeah. if you wanted to. So how, you know, this, this gets back a little to one of my original questions, which is how far electrification is gonna go and how much you're gonna need other stuff. Yeah. Where's, what role, how big of a role do you see hydrogen playing in the final analysis? Hydrogen could be enormous. It could be that we build as much power gen, as much renewables, to produce green hydrogen as we do for direct power uh, into you know, buildings and electric vehicles and so on. Uh, we'll see. I think there's things that where hydrogen is not the solution. As we mentioned earlier, like hydrogen-powered cars and trucks, forget about it. That's been clear for a decade. That's not going to be cost-competitive electrification. Um, you saw the Toyota guy now. Like, oh, this poor Toyota like, guy. So out to lunch. Like, they're they so good on, on hybrids, and they just, like, totally missed the boat on electrification. He's out, he's out now doing sort of the, like, uh, falling on his sword thing, apologizing oh, to good. everyone. And, yeah, I mean, it's clear. It's a little late. For anybody who doesn't know what we're talking about, the Toyota's, it was one executive, I think. It was, like, the legendary longtime head of Toyota was, like, electricity ish electricity it's going to be hydrogen fuel cells and just clung to that and some well of those, after <laughs> yeah and <laughs> that was a uniquely so. japanese thing like japan as a country has made some interesting you know on paper bets on hydrogen that just don't make any sense 
importing hydrogen across oceans is just is, hydrogen is so hard to move. It like mixing hydrogen into your natural gas in your natural gas pipelines. Yeah, that might work for just due distribution of the hydrogen. You know, hydro, like pipelines are the only cheap way we know to move hydrogen today. Or using the hydrogen to make steel, for instance, that you then ship around the world. Um, but hydrogen for like building heat doesn't make any sense. Hydrogen for cars doesn't make any sense. But hydrogen makes a ton of sense uh, for steel making, maybe for high temperature industrial heat. Uh, hydrogen makes a ton of sense as an ingredient to make electrofuels you can put in existing ships and planes, whether that's ammonia or a drop in kerosene. Uh, we'll probably never make hydrogen powered planes, they don't make any sense, but making uh, a drop in fuel from hydrogen that you can burn in existing. Boeing's and Airbus's uh, does potentially make sense. So it has, and hydrogen for green fertilizer. Uh, fertilizer is already like, I don't know, 70, 80 billion dollar market for hydrogen uh, goes into, you know, methane based hydrogen for fertilizer around the world today. So that's already like an enormous uh, market that once hydrogen gets cheap enough, it has various access to. Yeah, everybody should listen to the pod I just released this morning, I think. I'm not sure when this will come out, so this won't mean anything to listeners, but my last pod. A guy whose business model is off-grid renewables feeding directly into electrolyzers, making green hydrogen, which then go electri- directly into methanol. They're starting with methanol for ships. None yeah. of it's connected to the grid. No pipelines coming in or out. The only thing that comes out of the whole thing is trucks full of methanol. It's a really interesting it makes area. a ton of sense. It's way easier to move hydrogen as a product that's not hydrogen than as hydrogen right, itself. Right, right, right. That was his calculation. His calculation was it's really difficult to move hydrogen, and it's really difficult these days to move electricity. Yeah. So let's move the methanol. Let's make methanol and move it. I will say was that the policy details about hydrogen were mentioned in the earlier panel, and there's a big policy fight right now of what's, what gets counted as clean electricity for hydrogen, and there's every chance we're going to screw it up. And the IRA is going to be you know, interpreted by Treasury that actually controls who gets the tax credit to just let you like, buy grid electricity and unbundle directs, which are kind of BS, uh, as a way to call your hydrogen green. And if that's the case, it's going to set us back for a while. And we, like, we'll see how Treasury rules, uh, but it's not looking that pretty. Although it's worth saying that it says, not to get into this whole thing, but it says, it says in the statute that the hydrogen subsidies must reduce emissions. So yep. if they do it that way, it won't reduce emissions. So I don't see how they get around that very plain statutory language, although I'm sure if they tried hard I'd, enough. I'd love to be wrong. <laughs> I, hope, I hope that you're right. And another big battle going on around hydrogen that's maybe just worth calling out is, is natural gas companies that are dying, looking at obsolescence, flailing about for some reason to stay alive are now talking about mixing hydrogen in yeah. with natural gas to lower the greenhouse gas intensity of the yeah. natural gas, which is just, somebody, was, somebody compared it to pouring champagne in your municipal water supply or, uh, or, or something like that. Just the most ludicrous use of, of hydrogen possible. But that's a, there's a lot of money, a yeah. lot of money behind that one now. So hydrogen, a lot of opportunities for shenanigans around hydrogen. Um, I want to ask a, a bigger theoretical question because this is one of the <clears throat> one of my favorite things to talk about, and I'm never sure how seriously I take it. I'm never sure how serious I am about it. But um, when you look forward at the solar cost curve, you know it was ludicrously optimistic back in 2011. If you just do the same thing today, once again, it, like ten years out, it's just ludicrously cheap. It's just cheap beyond anything anybody knows how to process yeah. today. Uh, you know, wind too and batteries too, but mainly solar. And so, you know, as, you know, you had a great uh, chart about batteries, which just made the point that like, as they get cheaper, you find more uses for them. And as you find more uses for them, they build more and they scale up and they get cheaper, et cetera, et cetera, yeah. et cetera. Same for solar. Like, as it gets cheaper and cheaper and cheaper and cheaper, it's just going to be possible to put it everywhere on everything all the time. And so you can see in the, you know, in the, in the, in the distant future, but our lifetimes, I think, uh, a society in which power is 
ubiquitous yeah. and, 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 and to coin a phrase, too cheap to meter. Yeah. Um, <laughs> is that going to happen? I think, I think we'll always have a reason to pay for it. And we'll just, you know, appetite, as the cost goes down, appetite might go up. I mean, you look at other things, like the cost of lighting has dropped by a factor of 500 over the last century. Right? And that's a combination of power getting cheaper, like the way that we produce lighting getting cheaper, and efficiency, LEDs. Uh, so will the cost of power drop? Uh, eventually it will. I think that what you're going to see is right now the grid investment is sapping up most of the reduction in cost of renewables. Um, and we, the, the cost differential of power across time and space is going to change. What I mean by that is like today, power costs do fluctuate by season um, and by location, but fossil fuel costs vary less. Uh, whereas in the future, what you're going to find is like, how do you power stuff in winter? especially in a place far away from the equator. So the power cost average across the year might be cheaper, but in January, like in the UK, in, in London, you get one-seventh as much power from solar panels in January as you do in June or July. Mm-hmm. So that means that the cost of power from solar, at least, is going to be ludicrously high in winter. And guess what? UK energy use or Germany's peaks in winter. So I think you might find much cheaper power in certain times and places, but not as much in northern latitudes in winter. And that's going to cause funky things in sort of our power pricing. That having been said, like, I think there's every reason to believe that in the long run, energy is going to be cheaper for people than it is today, certainly as a proportion of, of income. Yeah, I guess I just wonder if you ever can imagine it becoming cheap enough and ubiquitous enough that we get to something like elevated global standards of living and, and getting, fully, lug, fully autonomous luxury communism or whatever you call it? Maybe. I mean, we're, we're getting more elevated standards of living around the world today, right? People don't know this, but global inequality peaked in the 1970s and has been dropping since then. If you compare, you know, countries around the world and not just within one country, uh, poverty has, you know, dropped massively. So we, you know, the number of people on earth that don't have electricity access has dropped materially in the last 10 or 20 years. The number of people without access to clean water and food has dropped a lot. In China and India, less so in Africa. So we are gradually increasing global abundance. Are, are we going fast enough? No, but it's happening. And I think there's every reason to believe that it will continue to happen. So let's talk about fast enough then, because obviously the, the counterweight to fully automated luxury communism is... Uh, climate dystopia. Who knows how those might balance out? What fun, what fun, we'll all find out. <laughs> it's good for science fiction. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I think it's clear, though, that even with all the good news these days and all the momentum behind clean energy and I think growing momentum, you could say, it l- looks pretty clear that we're not going to hit our 1.5 degree target that uh, we all agreed on in the UN, not at least through the replacement of fossil fuels with with clean energy uh, alone. So, you know, I think that's, people say that a lot and then, and then, you know, there's a sad trombone and everybody's sad for a while and then we move on. But like, it seems like we should, it seems like that's important and we should be like, thinking about what that means, yeah. what to do with that information, what we should, you know, what we should do. Are there emergency, you know, like, like pull, pull, pull handle if, if emergency type things we should be doing when we think about avoiding 1.5 yeah. uh, or trying to keep to 1.5 or compensating for not hitting for 1.5. So how do you, how do you think about sort of, if you think of the energy world as kind of going the right direction, but not fast enough. What do you do about the rise in temperature in the meantime? It's, it's a great question. I'd just like to put some numbers around that. When you and I both sort of got into this field, you know, 2011, let's say, we thought the world was headed for four, five, or six degrees Celsius of warming. And that's the, that's the difference between now and the middle of the last ice age. That is truly the stuff of nightmares. That is like agriculture would fail in various large parts of the world. Probably not an extinction level event, uh, but maybe the end of human society in certain ways. Like yes, really, I, I never forget good. Kevin Anderson's quote. It's four degrees is incompatible with organized global yeah. 
society. It ain't good, right? So the, the good news is we have very likely canceled that apocalypse. Like if you look at what's happened now, uh, just in the last 24 months, we had a raft of papers saying, uh, the most recent one says the most likely outcome, there's climate dice, there's probability distributions, there's lots of unknowns in this. But the most likely outcomes now are, I think the most recent paper said 2.1 and 2.4 degrees Celsius of warming. And so the good news is like we should all celebrate that for a while because that is a level of temperature that is actually compatible with the world overall growing richer. Okay? Like that is that is we've canceled, like it's no longer gonna be what's the movie where you have like a new ice age come in, whatever. Any of any of these day after tomorrow. Day after tomorrow. We're not we're not we're probably not headed for that right now. So like let's take a moment to like actually like be happy. And that, and that movie had an ice that. age literally coming like Block by block. There were people running away from it. <laughs> that would be really, really bad. Um, but the bad news is we have missed 1.5 degrees C. And I don't know how to say this any more clearly because there are people that will tell you that we might hit it. The odds of that are minuscule. You can still torture a model to get the model to, to, show, <laughs> to the, show us hitting it. The carbon budget, the remaining budget, the most recent papers like from uh, last month say that the carbon budget to have a 50-50 shot of staying below 1.5 C is about 250 gigatons. Okay? We're emitting about 50 gigatons of carbon per year. So that's five years of emissions. Or if we smoothly went from 2022's numbers to zero in 10 years, by 2032, we'd have about a 50-50 chance of staying below 1.5. That ain't gonna happen, okay? Like, it's just not a thing. Now, the good news is, to stay below two degrees C, it's about a trillion tons. So that's about 40 years of emissions. Uh, so that's about, yeah, a little over 20 years of emissions. If we had 40 years to reach zero, you know, a 50 to chance of staying below two degrees C. That's a stretch, 2062, <laughs> but it's not impossible. It's a stretch. Yes. And 2.5 degrees C is more than two trillion tons. So that, if you like, smooth out from today to net zero in 2100, you'd have a 50-50 chance, the models tell us, of staying below 2.5 degrees C. And that is totally achievable. So that's, that's the good news. Okay, what's the bad news? So first, like, at 1.5 degrees C, the world does not end. It doesn't end at 1.6 degrees C, uh, but every tenth of a degree matters. And right now, for instance, most recent papers say that every coral reef on Earth above 1.5 degrees C is experiencing bleaching events more rapidly than they can recover from. They won't all die on day one, but like they'll just enter a period of like permanent decline. Now the planet's gonna be fine. After the last mass extinction event, it took about four million years to recover biodiversity in the oceans. That ain't, that's nothing to the planet, but it's forever for human civilization. So our, our children and their children will not live in a place of, of such abundance. Okay, so what can you do? Um, I started to say that there's three things we have to do on climate. Number one is build. That's a lot of what we just talked about. Getting out of the way of permitting, having more policies to build stuff, and so on. Number two is help nature adapt. And I'm going to say the things that are like my most provocative things. Maybe you're not going to like me after this, but I'll just, <laughs> just call it how I see it. There is no such thing as wilderness on planet Earth anymore. We have modified the climate such that if, you're, if it's a forest, if it's a coral reef, if it's a wetlands, it doesn't exist in the same climactic band that that natural, natural ecosystem evolved in. And so if you want to preserve those, we have to actively manage every so-called wild ecosystem on Earth, whether that's a rainforest or a forest in the Northwest or in Canada or in the tundra or things like coral reefs. And there's ways we can do that, but we have to get off of this, this naturalistic fallacy of like, we should just leave nature alone. You leave nature alone, it's going to die. Right? The only way to do this is we, have to be, we know there's some coral species that do better in high temperatures and acidity. We can be, nobody wants to genetically engineer them, but you could be selectively breeding coral species for maximum survival rates uh, in high temperature and helping these coral reefs uh, adapt so that they can survive. So that's, that's one. And then the next one, which is the even more controversial one, is um, we've already geoengineered the planet. We just have. We've done it accidentally through carbon emissions. And we also done it by things like when people talk about solar radiation management, this the scary kind of geoengineering, what we're talking about is you know, reflecting more sunlight into space. Cloud brightening uh, or injecting um, aerosols into the stratosphere to reflect a tiny bit of sunshine uh, back into space. Nobody wants to do that, okay? But, <laughs> but let's be clear, we're already doing that and we're, we're undoing it unintentionally. Today, uh, if you look at IPCC's numbers, all greenhouse gases account for about three watts per square meter of warming. That's human activity. 
the sulfur aerosols we're already emitting from ship fuels, from diesel engines, from coal plants, low altitude, they cause acid rain and other nasty stuff. That's about one watt per square meter of cooling. That's already a solar shield with huge error bars, bigger error bars than, than uh, greenhouse gases. And guess what? We're undoing that. In 2000, the International Maritime Organization, new IMO regulations went in that reduced the sulfur content of ships. And that means that we're in for this bonus warming where we're undoing our solar shade uh, and we're going to have more warming happening. You see it. You can see from satellites shipping lanes uh, having less reflection and more sunlight being captured. Yes, this is an irony that is not well understood in the public, I think, is that by cleaning up air pollution, we are pretty radically accelerating warming. Yeah. So James Hansen, and James is a little bit of a radical son. He's got a paper out, and he's really, really worried about unforeseen bonus warming as we cut these uh, sulfur aerosols. So should we just, does that mean we just like start injecting some into the stratosphere? No. Uh, what we ought to do is some science. So to last year, before the IRA, the world spent about $1.1 trillion on climate tech. 1.4 if you ask the IEA. That's, you know, one times 10 to the ninth. The total budget for all science into solar radiation management has been about $10 million, right? Like one times 10 to the, the, the seventh, right? So I, I think I've got a, a factor of three off there. But uh, yeah, sorry, 10 to the 12th versus 10 to the seventh. So that's one 100,000th as much we spend on just doing like computer modeling and small experiments. And so I'm a modest man. I don't think we should spend a lot of money on this, but let's like spend a billion dollars a year. <laughs> That's nothing. Americans spend $4 billion a year on shampoo. So a billion dollars is not much. It ain't, it's like chump change. A billion dollars in climate gets you nothing. But let's spend like a small amount, a billion dollars a year on actually doing the science. Better computer models, more compute time, more funding for scientists, uh, platforms that have sensors for the next volcanic eruption happens, it sends stratospheric aerosols up, we can send LIDAR and spectrography and so on through them and see what happens. And some small controlled experiments, tiny ones, to actually see how this works, just to know, do we have this tool in our toolbox so that we could deploy it if the Arctic starts to warm uh, exceptionally fast, we have uncontrolled methane release. And if we're not doing that, I think that's criminal. And that is the, the single biggest uh, problem that we have in climate tech, the single biggest omission that we have in our climate plans today. Oh, yes. Okay, so we're done, everybody. Thank you for coming. Thanks. Give money to Canary. Thanks, David. That's going to do it for the show. Uh, stay tuned at the end of the credits for a special interview with Core Power CEO Lindsey Goral on the future of battery storage. Um, again, you heard David Roberts and Ramez Nam just now. You can find both of those guys on Twitter. You can find David at volts.wtf. And this episode was produced by the Canary Media team and uh, written by me. The Carbon Copy is a co-production of PostScript Media and Canary Media. Sean Marquand is our engineer. And original music came from Sean Marquand, who wrote our theme song, and from Echo Finch and Blue Dot Sessions. PostScript Media is supported by Prelude Ventures, and Prelude is a venture capital firm with a wide portfolio across energy, food and agriculture, transportation, logistics, advanced materials, manufacturing, and advanced computing. And hook us up with a rating and review of this podcast if you like it. And send your thoughts on social media. And um, we'll catch you next time. Thanks for being here. I'm Stephen Lacey. This is The Carbon Copy. We are building a battery-powered world. From mobility to the grid, batteries are being placed in everything around us. But America doesn't make many of those batteries. Core Power is a U.S. manufacturer making battery cells, energy storage systems, and asset management systems for a wide range of applications. Lindsey Goral is Core Power's founder and CEO. There's a lot of really good innovation in the United States right now and in North America on new electric boats or underground mining to electro, electric, electric systems or cool EVs and electric or three-wheelers and that kind of stuff that aren't getting any support from the big companies because they're focused with the big OEMs. And so we are focused really on that sector and the EV side because if you don't focus on that sector, the sector will die. Core Power is also building solutions for stationary storage on the grid, a market that's grown almost 1,800% in the last five years, according to Wood McKenzie. We're focused heavily on 
both utility grilled, energy storage, CNI, support to the grid, support to, to EV charging. So that's a big piece of us too. So we're kind of EV charging, energy storage, and also kind of tier two, tier three uh, EV companies. I spoke with Lindsay about Core Power's plans to ramp up the Coreplex Gigafactory in Arizona, where the company is building a U.S.-centric battery ecosystem. We are producing what's called NMC technology, cell manufacturing, and LFP. So over 90% of the lithium cells in the world are under those both those chemistries, and we have both. So we can produce any cell that we want for any industry. So you recently announced uh, a fundraise, $75 million, that will go toward building the, the Gigafactory that is underway right now in Arizona. Talk about the capital needs for that facility and, and the timeline for building out that facility. Sure. We're excited that we started. We broke ground or started moving dirt uh, about five months ago. Uh, we'll be in production with the first six gigawatt hours of cell manufacturing in 2025 and the second phase of nine gigawatt, nine gigawatt hours online by 2026. So we are targeting a total demand of 15 gigawatt hours of manufacturing of the Coreplex by 26, but we believe based on the market demand and what's going on now, it will grow even bigger than that after 2026 by building additional manufacturing lines. The, the cost of the Coreplex is around a billion dollars. Um, and we're, we're just finalizing, we've got a, a, quite a bit of funding already. We're finalizing the rest of the funding over, the next, over this year. And why Arizona? I think once we, once we looked at all the different types, all the different states, at the end of the day, Arizona fit the bill on a couple of different things. One, you know, all these all the states we looked at had the infrastructure. Once the infrastructure was done, you knew you could build it. You know, what we like is dry and hot for cell manufacturing. And then by looking at where we are in Buckeye, Arizona, for logistics, it's really good to get to the port on the West Coast to ship overseas, but also employment. It was one of the fastest growing cities in America, had a lot of good schools, has good, good college, community colleges, has great universities, has great tech schools. So we saw our ability that if we built there, because all the infrastructure was there, we think we could help build a an excited, basically, employment group of young people to join our company. What is the hardest piece of building a company like Core Power? <laughs> That's a really good question. My background in the supply chain has helped me quite a bit because I understand the issues on supply. And so I've been working very hard with a number of companies looking ahead. I want to, I'm now a fully integrated solution company, but I, could, I need to get there by making sure I control my supply chain, right? So I, even though a lot of the stuff we're working on is bigger than just us, uh, obviously bigger for the United States, but that's huge. And then the other side of it is employment. You know, I, what I really want to do is I want to have these young students coming through high school and understanding what, who we are, that we're advanced manufacturing, that we're green energy, and, I, and we want to be involved in going to these high schools and going to these tech schools and teaching them about the industry, and we want them excited to come to the industry. So I think it's twofold, right? It's one is the whole thing about supplying the ability to build what you want to build, and, we, and that's one we worked on that. The other side is building and, and trying to help young people to be excited about the industry and want to come into this industry and see this as the next generation of the, of the world. We're, you know, come in, let's help the world, let's help the United States become green. You know, I think those are the two things I would say that we focused on a lot in the last, and we're still focused on it. Again, Lindsey Gorrell is the founder and CEO of Core Power. To learn more about Core Power's investments in American industry and workers, go to corepower.com slash carbon copy. That's K-O-R-E power.com slash carbon copy.